Alright guys, welcome back to F1 News after a terrible start to the season for Mercedes. Big update today on exactly what is going wrong with their car, but also questions as to whether Toto Wolff is the right man to lead this team forward. Toto himself has actually responded to these claims saying yes, he would consider stepping aside from the role if there was somebody else best positioned to take Mercedes back to the top. Is it fair to question Toto's leadership, especially with another decline year on year? Very much interested your thoughts in the comments below. Hit the like button if you enjoy. Subscribe if you're new as always, I would greatly appreciate it. First of all, Ferrari had a great weekend. Lewis Hamilton is most certainly looking over the fence to some degree what they are up to. Red Bull even recognise on tracks with certain levels of graining, the Ferrari is particularly strong. That seemed to be the case this time out in Australia and Red Bull, because Verstappen didn't get to complete the Grand Prix, don't really know whether their setup choices for the weekend were correct or not and whether they would have been able to win with that strategy. Helmut Marco said yes, Perez had the floor damage for the last half of the Grand Prix pretty much after the Alonso overtake, but he did say that yeah, more than likely our setup might have just been eating the tyres or it was a consequence of the damage that Perez had. Could be either way but Ferrari were strong regardless. I think you can see this as well with Haas's progress. They were not expecting their car to be good Haas. They made that very clear during the course of the offseason. They expected to turn up to Bahrain and be P19, P20 effectively. That has not been the case. They scored double points in Australia for the first time in two years since I think Austria 2022 when their double points with Magnussen and Schumacher as it was at the time their car typically is rather good there but the Haas is much better than they thought yes the Sauber is terrible the Alpine is terrible but nonetheless P9 P10 very impressive results and you've got to say part of that comes down to the fact that they take as much as they can from Ferrari if the Ferrari gets better if the parts they give to Haas get better then what do you know the Haas gets better so I think that kind of goes to show where Ferrari are at to some degree but the big drama, of course, of the Grand Prix, at least the first three or four laps, was Verstappen's retirement from the race. The right rear brake getting stuck on, and it got worse and worse over time, until which point the brake just caught on fire, the tyre exploded, and that was Verstappen's Grand Prix over with. Now, Brembo, they are the primary manufacturer for brakes in Formula 1. They, I think, make the brakes for most of the teams. Mercedes, I think, use Carbon Industries, or I think they have a different name, such as Safran, something like that. There's a few brake manufacturers that are used. Now, Red Bull, I believe for this season have swapped over to Brembo. Those are the same manufacturer that Ferrari uses. And also, let's not forget, Charles Leclerc had some brake issues in Bahrain when he just could not stop locking up into turn 10. So over the first few races, there have been a few issues with brakes, Brembo designs. And there are questions, I'm sure, from Red Bull as to whether you know, these reliability problems. Now, sure, they must think there's other advantages to the Brembo designs that make them better for Red Bull because they've made that decision recently. But it seems a consequence might be some degree of unreliability. And Brembo say themselves, nothing to do with us guys. It was a setup problem from Red Bull and is not attributable to their materials or components. So, of course, I imagine they are going to be saying that. But I'm sure Red Bull will have their thoughts because we're a couple of races in. There have been some brake problems potentially attributable to the manner manufacturers of the brakes and Red Bull are now, well, they've got those for the rest of the season, right? So you could argue that Red Bull have to figure this out ASAP or it is plausible that more unreliability from these components could result from now to the end of the season. Speaking of Red Bull, Helmut Marko seems to go back and forth on what he says on Yuki Tsunoda. Yesterday he was all full of praise for Tsunoda, super mature driver this season, although maybe he didn't watch Bahrain after the Grand Prix. I rate Yuki very highly as does Marko, but he does say one swallow doesn't make a summer. He needs to improve more before he can be considered for the Red Bull direction. So it doesn't seem like, regardless of what Sonoda does, that they really see him as the Red Bull caliber driver. Especially when you've got Christian Horner, who was asked a question on Yuki and said, well, you know, would he be viable for the seat? He said, well, there's other options. You've got to look at the market being fluid outside of that. And Sainz just won the Grand Prix, a very fast unemployed driver. So there's lots to talk about a potential Sainz Verstappen partnership at Red Bull. I mean, Sainz Verstappen at Red Bull, Hamilton, Leclerc at Ferrari. If the cars are equal-ish, that would be an absolute banger of a season. Now, there's also talk, okay, it's from Ralph Schumacher, but we saw yesterday rumours that Christian Horner is pretty keen to get a Fernando Alonso into the team. And it's interesting that this has emerged as a rumour, if this is actually true, just because... 
you wouldn't think this would have been sensible if Verstappen is staying for sure. Because the feeling would be, you want to put Verstappen with a driver like a Perez, like a Bottas, there's other options that, you know, even Ricardo, if they were to put him in the team, wouldn't, I think, on current form, be able to really compete with where Verstappen is. And that seems to have been the way that Red Bull like to set things up. You know, number one driver, number two driver. Bringing Alonso in, you know that that's going to cause some degree of a problem. Alonso absolutely would come in there to win races and championships if Horner is keen to do this. So it makes me think that Horner is at least considering the possibility that Max leaves. And that's what Ralph Schumacher says, that yeah, apparently there are big intentions in the background to bring Fernando into the Red Bull cockpit next year to have another strong driver if Max leaves. So maybe the thought is from Horner, well, if we get Alonso, if Max stays, fine, we'll deal with the chaos. And if Max goes, then great, we've got Alonso. So we'll see how that goes. I mean, there was rumours a little while ago now that it was Piastri and Albon that Red Bull were looking for if Verstappen was to go. But of course, there's lots of decision makers at Red Bull and it's not just Christian Horner. He might well have his own ideas. But we've got to talk about Mercedes because here's George Russell back in the simulator today. Now, just note, by the way, what track is this, guys? This is uh, not Japan. This is Australia coming out of, it's got to be out of the far chicane, isn't it? It's on the run down into those final series of corners. So look, they're still in Australia and this, I guess, is standard practice. You do the Grand Prix, you come back home and then you get in the sim and you kind of do some laps in the actual track that you were on this past weekend to see how things compare. It's a massive problem for Mercedes, their correlation between the simulator and what's happening in reality. They've even hired from Ferrari one of their top simulator specialist guys to Mercedes to try and use him to help figure out what is going wrong with their simulations right now because it's clearly a massive problem. Toto Wolff himself, by the way, won't even be in Japan. This will be a common feature as time progresses, not just from Mercedes but also from other teams. Missing Grand Prix, of course, he missed uh, Brazil 2022 kind of famously when they won and had a one two that weekend but with 24 Grand Prix they're not going to be there all the time he's going to be from home he's going to be on his setup and he's going to be you know analyzing whatever's going on from there so he's not going to be in Japan maybe that's going to be a good luck over or something as it was in Brazil 2022 because they certainly need it right now a shocking weekend for Mercedes this is Lewis Hamilton's engine failure of course he was running okay good start on the soft tires then he switched to the hards and you know seemed to have not much pace let's be real neither did George Russell but then the car blew up and you know he didn't have to drive the car anymore for the rest of the race. It's not like the car is terrible to drive, maybe. It's just super slow. I think that's the feedback so far. George Russell, it was interesting, right? Because he had no pace for a large part of the Grand Prix. Then all of a sudden, the Mercedes had pace on the final stint. The second stint on the hard tyre was slow. The third stint on the hard tyre was all of a sudden fast. So Mercedes are so confused what is going on because he was able to catch up to Alonso and probably, maybe not probably, but he would have had a chance to overtake him if he hadn't crashed right and Alonso pulls whatever you want to say tactics whether you think they're dirty or not that's a question Fernando would say it's the art of racing but whatever it is I mean Fernando didn't put Russell in the wall Russell put himself in the wall and we know the penalty for Alonso resulted and just by comparison here these were the standings over the last couple of years after the first few races 2021 of course it was Hamilton versus Verstappen at the front of the field 2022 after the two DNFs for Max it was uh, Leclerc leading the championship with Russell in P2 and Hamilton P5. Last year it was a Red Bull 1-2 and then Hamilton was P4. This year, no Mercedes drivers anywhere to be seen. It's actually Piastri who is P5 with 28 points. Verstappen is P1 by not much, obviously, after the DNF. Sainz, if he had have raced in Jeddah, would probably have been top of the standings right now, but he didn't. So it's Leclerc who is closest to Verstappen right now. And if you look at the overall constructor standings, last year with not a great Mercedes car. The W14 was clearly inferior to the Aston at the start of last season, but after three Grand Prix after Australia, they were third. This year, they're fourth, and arguably, Aston has a quicker car as it presently stands. That's how it seemed over the last couple of Grand Prix. So these are how the standings look. Mercedes are right now the third fastest Mercedes-powered car. And Hamilton even said it's the worst start to the season that he's ever had. Two poor Grand Prix, and then his car blew up. So just not great at all. And we can see this by the numbers here. So this is just George Russell's data compared to the leader, who of course was Carlos Sainz. So look at this grey line here from... From George Russell that goes from let's say 20 laps into the Grand Prix he was 20 seconds behind 40 laps into the Grand Prix he was almost exactly 40 seconds behind so Russell was losing during that stint a second a lap to the fastest you know, man on the track which of course was Carlos Sainz in the final stint however all of a sudden this gap started to close you guys can see the line here from Russell to 
Sainz gets much flatter. He catches up Alonso and he potentially could have had him. But of course, at that point, Russell was already 47 seconds off the lead in about 47 laps, right? And I mean, arguably in Verstappen's hands, maybe the Red Bull was going to be even faster. Given the fact that it was Ferrari and Mercedes in a very tight battle last year for second in the constructors, and now the Mercedes is a second a lap slower than the Ferrari around a circuit where last year's Mercedes and the Mercedes before that was actually really rather good. It's, um, well, it's nothing short of embarrassing. But as I say, at the end of the Grand Prix, all of a sudden, Russell was down here in, you know, some pretty competitive lap times right up here at the front of the field. So it was confusing why the Mercedes still is absolutely all over the place. They just don't understand what is going on with this car. They don't understand why their positive performance in Bahrain was not um, retained when they got to the actual race in Bahrain. Yes, they had cooling issues and they thought, well, without the cooling issues, we'd have been competing potentially for the race win. Probably not, but certainly for P3 was on the table if they had those extra tents in hand. They go to Jeddah though and they have no high speed performance at all. So apparently this weekend they raised the ride height of the car so it stopped the bouncing problems and it actually increased dramatically their high speed performance. But as a result, it hurts them in the slow speed and in their straight line speed. So Toto Wolf says FP3 showed us the potential this car has, but it's so tricky to get it into this place. There is no simple solution to this at the moment. It's funny, right? because Mercedes last year said, well, all of the bad elements of this car, the spiteful rear ends, they've been eliminated, and now the car is a perfectly good platform. We just need to add the performance. Turns out the car isn't a perfectly good platform, and again, it's a diva, you know, like the last two years, certainly the W13, they described it as a diva. This year's car was meant to be more consistent. Doesn't seem that way from the outside looking in, and they're still really struggling to understand why in FP3 they had good performance. They were very close to the fastest car on the track, and then in qualifying, both drivers barely went faster, if didn't go faster at all, than their time in practice in far inferior conditions. And it seems Mercedes are at some sort of a disagreement as to exactly what is causing this. Not all engineers at Mercedes believe that changes in conditions are a factor. One engineer says just a few degrees of change in road surface temperature in the strength of the winds shouldn't account for 0.7 seconds a lap, because that's basically what happens. They were like a second off the pace, then all of a sudden they were three tenths off the pace with George Russell, of course, you know, Hamilton wasn't there for reference because his engine had died. But Mercedes don't really seem to know exactly what is going on. And this was the discussion here as well in from AMU yesterday. Just thought I'd share these last couple of paragraphs here. The problem started at 2.30 kph. Even though we weren't in contact with the ground yet, somehow above a certain ground clearance, the flow structures have to change in such a way that they interfere with each other. That is a question of millimeters. They tried to solve the problem with a different underbody specification in Melbourne and the setup that keeps the vehicle height more stable. The car was immediately better in the fast corners, but then it claimed victims in the slow corners and at the top speed. And Shovlin says, it's like a blanket that is too small for the bed. No matter where you pull it, there's always something free. Our job now is to make this blanket bigger. So that's what Mercedes are trying to achieve. But let's not forget the W13 had, I think, 17 podiums in 2022 and a race win. Last year's W14 had zero race wins and I think eight podiums, something to that effect. This year's car is it even going to get a podium? As it stands, it doesn't look like it. I think Mercedes certainly will, but they look miles away from race victors, and they are genuinely like a midfield team right now on their recent performances. They still believe their car has within it the possibility to be right up there with the fastest cars on the grid, and the Ferrari most certainly. Maybe the Red Bull probably will be significantly further up the field, especially when we get to a circuit like Suzuka. But Mercedes have a lot to understand. Toto Wolff has said they're going to do experiments every week weekends, not just in practice, but also in the race, effectively, because they've got to understand what is happening. And Lewis Hamilton, I'm sure, thinks, you know, come on, do I keep having to do these experiments? Can I just leave to Ferrari already? Which I'm sure is on his mind. But after a terrible weekend, Toto Wolff has said, you know, what did I show at the start of the video here? I want to punch myself on the nose. But he also was asked the question about his leadership. Is he the right man to take the team back to the top? He gave himself, because he owns part of the team and he makes the decisions, a contract extension at Mercedes as their TP for another little bit of time. And, you know, we wondered and speculated at the time whether that was kind of a move to say to Lewis Hamilton, hey, look, you know, we're still committed. We've got uh, James Allison signed on to a long-term deal. I'm staying around for a long-term deal. But Toto admits that, yeah, it's fair to question his leadership. I'll, I need to make sure that my contribution is positive. So I would be the one to say, if somebody has a better idea, tell me. I'm interested in turning this team around as quickly as possible. I'd be happy to give my input on who that would be, on what that would be, or who that could be. So effectively admitting that, yeah, if you've got a better idea, 
idea as to who can lead this team forward. Toto Wolff would be willing to resign effectively and step away from that team principal role and just, you know, go back to being on the board or whatever effectively and owning the team from afar and put somebody else in charge. You know, there's even an argument that James Valls could be a good guy, but he's fighting fires right now over at Williams that need to be resolved. He goes on to say, though, that he doesn't believe this is the case. Obviously, he's not going to say, yeah, I'm a terrible team principal, actually, I'm a fraud and I need to resign. He's going to say, no, we don't have a, an organizational problem or a philosophical problem. We have a physics problem. But they're all kind of intertwined, right? Because your physics problem is because the organization isn't as strong as it used to be. They have hemorrhaged so many staff over the last, especially four years, Mercedes, to various other teams. Their team clearly isn't as strong and doesn't have the depth of understanding they once did. That is a physics problem, but it stems from the organizational problem, does it not? What do you guys think about that in the comment section below? I look myself in the mirror every single day about everything I do. And if I believe that I should ask the manager question or the trainer question, I think it's a fair question, but it's not what I feel at the moment that I should do. So he still feels like, obviously, he's the right person to leave Mercedes, but there are serious questions as to whether that is actually the case. And, you know, obviously this clip from Christian Horner a while ago on Drive to Survivor, he said, yes, I run the team differently to, to Toto. He's much more motivated by the financials of Formula One and also said that, you know, Toto inherited a very well-oiled machine when he took over the team and says that really Toto didn't have to do anything. So, you know, look, I'm not sure that's true. I think Toto deserves a lot of credit for the success that Mercedes had over those eight years. But I think it's no secret that people are calling into question massively whether he is the right man from a team principal perspective to lead the team forward. Yes, they've had all that success, but think where Ferrari might be had Fred Vasseur come in one year earlier, right? During 2022, Mattia Bonotto was there. They designed a terrible 2023 car, really, when Vasseur first came into the team. And over the last 18 months, Vasseur, I think, has massively turned that team around. You know, the right man for the job in the team principal role makes a massive difference. And the question as to whether Toto is that guy is a big debate. And Hamilton maybe doesn't think that he is best positioned because he's leaving the team at the end of the day. And Mercedes are still trying to wonder why they're performance gets better over the course of the entire weekend. Toto goes on to say that, you know, look, Hamilton's as good as you can possibly be as a driver. The drivers, you know, it's important in the whole setup. He's obviously looking at the other side of the fence and it's good what's happening there, but that's not his priority. The priority is to turn this car around, which it will be to some degree. Like Hamilton would still love to win a race this year or to at least get some podiums this year as right now that seems to be relatively far away. So Hamilton, I'm sure, would be reasonably happy to sacrifice a little bit at the start of the season to try and help the team understand but if it gets to halfway through the year and nothing is improving, Hamilton's probably just going to give up on the experimentation side because all he'd be doing is helping Mercedes for next year at that point, which is counterproductive. So for now, Hamilton's focus remains on Mercedes, but I would say by the summer break, he's going to be very much looking over the fence at Ferrari, right? And I mean, have a look at this. Uh, the last three times we've raced in Australia, it's been two Ferrari victors, nobody from Mercedes. And um, well, of course, we can see the record here from Max and Charles over the last couple of years. We'll see if that happens to Sainz next year wherever he might potentially be driving just one final to mention actually on the Hamilton thing Angela Cullen very famous face in the paddock here she is on the right hand side long time trainer and personal assistant and confidant and friends of Lewis Hamilton they parted ways kind of uh, what was it after Jeddah 2023 maybe in kind of weird circumstances when it wasn't clear why precisely there was talk that um, you know Cullen wanted to go in a new direction and so did Hamilton and I'm sure it was all amicable but it was still kind of unclear why Hamilton had decided to make this change of direction and now actually she's back in the paddock but in the IndyCar paddock working with Marcus Armstrong so that's pretty cool stuff but also I guess raises the point as to whether you know because at the time there was theories as well Hamilton hasn't fired her she just wants to pursue new opportunities and stuff but that didn't really make that much sense given I think they'd done Bahrain together and then they were gone before they got to Jeddah and she's still working in motorsport here so I thought a nice update nonetheless but uh, obviously it's going to raise some questions I very much enjoyed your thoughts in the comments below hit the like button if you enjoyed Subscribe if you're new, take care, and I'll see you next time.